Okay. So let's carry on and talk about localization of uh, Broca's aphasia and whether aphasia syndromes even localize at all. So let's take a look here. What we typically do, of course, is acquire um, MRI images, uh, uh, structural images, first of all, to look at the location of the lesion, where the stroke occurred. And in many cases, well, now it's you know, very easy to get 3D representations of these lesions. And so this is actually the brain of the gentleman you just saw, the second patient. So you could see the temporal lobe, occipital, cerebellum, frontal lobe, parietal, they're all perfectly intact except for these areas right here. So indeed, part of Broca's area is affected also regions a little bit more anterior, also a little bit of the superior temporal gyrus. And you can see here these dark areas. They're darker because we're seeing um, the lesion going all the way through to the ventricles. So the darker areas are represented by cerebral spinal fluid. This fluid, uh, I mean, this lesion is so deep that uh, you can see the change in the, um, uh, in the darkness, um, and so you're looking at, again, this cerebral spinal fluid. So this lesion actually goes uh, nearly up to the ventricle uh, in this patient's case. Okay, so I'm gonna talk to you just quickly about what we do. I wanna focus more on the aphasia types so we uh, all get to learn about those, but I also wanna be sure to talk a little bit about the methods that we use to examine um, aphasic patients, not really so much the tests and behavioral methods, though I'm very happy to talk about that another time, but also some of the neuroimaging methods that we use to assess localization of function, because in this way, our patients are able to uh, inform us about uh, different language functions and whether or not these might be localizable. All right, so basically what we do is we conduct very extensive testing, speech, language, neuropsychological, uh, as well as neurological and neuroradiological exams of chronic aphasic stroke patients uh, in order to really understand what deficits they're experiencing. We always, when we're doing localization work, we always work with chronic aphasic patients. So I wanna stress that. These are patients who are at least one year post onset, right? Acutely, these patients will look very different. They'll be much more severe, for one thing, okay? And they may present with a global aphasia in the hospital, but maybe six months later, they evolve into a Broca's aphasia. Maybe even 12 months later, they evolve into an anomic aphasia. So the aphasia actually uh, um, becomes less and less severe. Does it go away completely? That, of course, is the difficult question and part of what we're trying to investigate with these methods here to look at not only helping us with diagnosis, but also prognosis. All right, so I also mentioned we get uh, structural neuroimaging at the time and we warp these into a common stereotactic space. So we can take all of our patients' lesions, warp them into the Montreal Neurological Institute space. That way we can look at patient from patient to patient in the same stereotactic space and make comparisons. We have very strict uh, inclusion criteria in these studies. I'm not gonna go through all of it, but um, basically rest assured that they're really carefully screened. Do we exclude left-handers? No, we run everybody, but we put the left-handers in a separate group, um, patients with multiple lesions and so on. Uh, so what I'm talking about today are patients who, have, who are right-handed premorbidly and who are native English speakers with no previous neuropsychological uh, deficits. Okay, so then we use various methods in order to establish brain behavior relationships. And one of the easiest ones to do, and especially when we talk about aphasia syndromes, is to just pick out the patients who show the same deficits. Do they all have a Broca's aphasia? Do they all have an apraxia of speech? Do they all have an ataxic dysarthria or what have you? And group them together and tell the computer, okay, let's retrieve all of those lesions that we've reconstructed and overlap them one on top of each other so we can see if there's any common areas of infarction uh, that can be found. So this would be an example of such a map and actually it turns out to be an overlay of our patients with Broca's aphasia. So so out of, I think when this was done, we had about 150 patients who met these stringent uh, exclusion criteria. They're all single left hemisphere strokes, by the way. Uh, we had 36 patients with Broca's aphasia, and when we overlap their lesions, we want to know what area of involvement do we see in all of the patients. So in this case, we're looking for red. Well, in fact, 
This is where Broca's area is. You can find Broca's area because you look at the anterior horn of the lateral ventricle and you kind of follow the curve and it takes you out here to the cortex, which is the area that we think of most commonly as Broca's area. So we're talking about Brobin's area 44 and 45. A lot of people will have very, definition, very different definitions for what they will include as Broca's area, and that's fine. You just want to make sure that you're really clear what area that you're talking about, okay? Now, in fact, um, what we see in terms of the common area of overlap is this red area. It's a very large region. It kind of straddles over to here a little bit. But all of the patients have lesions in this central area. You could see that these are big lesions. They're not localized to Broca's area. So right away, something tells us, wait a minute, didn't we think that all patients with Broca's aphasia had a Broca's area lesion? And the answer is no, they don't. That is not a consistent relationship. A lot of people get really upset by that. And I'm sorry, I apologize. But the fact is that a patient can have a Broca's aphasia, like these three cases, and not have a lesion in Broca's area at all. Right? You can have patients who have lesions in Broca's area and have no Broca's aphasia. So the relationship between Broca's area and Broca's aphasia is not the pure relationship you're led to believe in, you know, just uh, simple textbooks that don't really go into the uh, difference very much. You had a question. Yes. Could you please then define again what is Broca's area defined by the patient? Yes. Ah, I'm going to get to that. There's a whole story about that that I love to tell you. So I'll come back to that, okay? Yes. That's a great question, and the answer is no. The reason is because even though many of the lesions might, uh, the overlays might fall in um, common areas, you don't see that in other aphasias. So we'll see in Wernicke's aphasia, the overlap is not here, it's down here. So it's not just an issue of the vascular uh, configuration of that region of the brain. It is true that this region of the brain here tends to be an area that is common in stroke. There are small arteries, lenticulostriate arteries, that go through there that are really tiny, and so blood clots will, get, will be lodged there quite frequently. So that is true, but it doesn't affect uh, the results we see in lesion overlays or in voxel-based lesion uh, symptom mapping or anything like that. Yeah. So more precisely, I wasn't putting into question the whole method of analysis. I was just saying it might be that parts of this red area just with Right. Um, uh, in Broca's aphasia, that could be true, but not true in conduction aphasia, Wernicke's aphasia, enomic aphasia. Yeah. So, but there's a, there's a reason why this area seems to be commonly uh, involved, and we'll come to that in, uh, in a moment. Yeah. So, uh, again, I hate to break it to you. Yeah. Sorry, good question. Um, does the occurrence of that kind of aphasia in the frontal cortex happen just as much in the it probably happens just as much in the right hemisphere, but the difference is that we don't see those patients because they don't present with the same kind of profound symptoms. So sometimes those patients will come in, they usually don't come into the speech clinic because they don't have language problems. Yeah. Yeah. Would you find the same pattern if you scan the patient uh, closer to the, the stroke? Uh, if you scan them closer to the stroke, Basically what it would tell you is, if you saw a patient with a lesion like this, you would say, you would, you would know that's a pretty big lesion. It's running deep, it's affecting a lot of different areas that are in fact involved in speech and language, and the prognosis for that patient is that he or she will probably always be aphasic to some extent, but less aphasic than they are the day after the stroke, or even two weeks after the stroke. So it can help us with prognosis. If I see a, an MRI scan with that lesion, I'll think, okay, that's going to be a Broca's aphasic right now for sure. Hopefully we're going to help with treatment to be able to get that patient to improve their fluency skills so that uh, their main problem is now going to be word finding, which is much less of a problem than uh, the kinds of production problems we saw before. Now, unfortunately, if the lesion runs really deep, 
and is very large like this, we see lesions like that that really involve a lot of the white matter. Unfortunately, the prognosis is less good, and we'll go through that a little bit. Um, and if we don't have time, ask me afterwards, because I could talk about this all day. OK, so let's go forward. Um, the fact is that if the lesion is in Broca's area alone, let's talk about areas, Broadman's areas 44 and 45, the posterior part of the inferior frontal gyrus, these lesions tend to result in a transient mutism for about three to six weeks. So the patient doesn't talk, might be completely mute, but if we see that patient two months later or three months later, their speech is much improved. I mean, to the point where they're really producing sentences. Maybe not the best of sentences, but they are producing um, speech output. So it's clear that even though Broca's area is important, it has to be important because the patient is mute. So it has to play some kind of role. But the question is, does it play the role that we've attributed to it now over the last 50 years? It's clear to me that there must be other areas that are involved in um, the production of language than just Broca's area. And it turns out that's exactly what happens. We have to remember that Broca's aphasia is comprised of many different signs and symptoms. You remember that long list we saw. They have reading problems and writing problems and repetition problems and they have motor speech problems and the list is long. Do we really think all of those functions are located in one area of the brain? I don't think so. It's too much stuff, too complicated, too much going on, and we know that if the lesion affects that region of the brain, that those problems go away, right? They disappear after uh, three to six weeks. There are, the neurosurgeon Penfield, for example, wrote of a case in which he had to excise Broca's area for, for important neurosurgical reasons, and the patient was again mute for three weeks and then recovered. All right? These are not isolated cases. We see this all the time. So it tells us something else is going on. There are other reg regions that uh, contribute. And an important thing to remember is that aphasia syndromes don't localize to small areas of the brain. So we saw in the 3D MRI of that case of Broca's aphasia, lots of different regions are involved. Okay? It turns out each of those are discrete areas that are involved in different aspects of speech and language. The lesion that produces the Broca's aphasia has to be big enough to encompass all of those regions so that all of those symptoms occur. Does that make sense? We're going to come back to that because it's a really important point. Yes? How do you think into account like compensatory mechanisms? Um, that's why we look at patients a year post onset. So in the first couple of months, there's lots of stuff going on, including a lot of swelling in the brain. And there's a lot of of personal issues going on and psychological issues, you name it. So we're not getting a really good picture of what occurs, of, of what has been affected by that lesion. We could see lots of things have been affected in the first couple of weeks. But later, because we see patients long term, we see them through the whole first year and many years after that, we could see what the long term effects are. And for us, we want to be able to say to a new patient who comes in, we want to be able to look at that MRI or CT scan and say, all right, these areas, these areas, these areas, and these areas have been involved, not just Broca's areas involved and Wernicke's areas involved. These white matter pathways A, B, and C have been involved. Hence, we know that in other patients who have a similar lesion like this, when they were a year post-onset, they continued to have these problems. All right, so we can make a judgment then, if this patient is like all of those other 250 patients we've already looked at, then, chan you know, then we have a pretty good idea of the prognosis for this patient. Why does that matter? It matters because it will drive our treatment technique, okay? If a patient first appears with um, word finding problems and an apraxia of speech, and we see that the region that's associated with speech practices is not affected, I'm not going to treat the apraxia of speech. It's going to go away on its own. I'm going to focus on the word finding problem. Okay? So it helps us drive our treatment techniques so that we can really spend the time, because speech therapy, at least in the United States, is incredibly expensive, and patients don't get it for very long. We want to maximize that amount of time. That's why this is important to us. OK. Um, does anything localize in the brain? It's actually much more productive, as I hinted at before, to evaluate the specific 
deficits and the brain regions that might be subserving those particular functions. And I'm going to briefly go through one because we don't have a lot of time and we still have other types of aphasia to go through. I'm focusing a lot on Broca's aphasia because of the methods that we use that uh, will apply to all of the other aphasias that we look at as well, and the concepts um, as well. Let's look, for example, at the idea of having to articulate the sounds we want to we wanna say. Okay? So this is um, a, a, a function we call um, coordinating complex articulatory movements. This means we want to get the articulators to do the right thing at exactly the right time. Otherwise, the wrong sounds are going to come out. Okay? So patients who have this problem are known to have apraxia of speech, or speech apraxia. Okay? It's a disorder that is well studied in the United States and in other countries in which there are lots of consonant clusters. We don't see much apraxia of speech in Italian or in Hawaiian, although I'd really like to test that a little bit more because I'd have to go to Hawaii to do it. But when, cons when languages are basically consonant vowel, consonant vowel languages, apraxia of speech won't really emerge in the same way in, in languages with consonant clusters. So here's, here's what happens. A patient with apraxia of speech can retrieve the words they want. They want to say pointer, but they don't necessarily make the right sounds. It might come out as pointer or pointer, right, which is not quite correct. They know they're making the mistake. They know that they've uh, uh, said the word incorrectly. Here's some examples. Here's a patient trying to say the word cushion, and he says, oh, uh, uh, chicken, uh, 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 duck. Okay, he knows that's not right, and he says, I know what it's called. Okay, that comes out fluently. Then he says it's C-U, he even knows how to spell it. So he knows what the word is. No, it's chukun, he still can't get it quite right. Here's another example. Sometimes we ask patients to do um, repetition of words that, have, that are long and have consonant clusters in them. It's really mean. We have to apologize profusely, but we have to do it in order to detect the apraxia of speech. Here's a patient trying to say catastrophe, and he says catastrophe, and he's so happy. He tries it again, catastrophe. Okay, he knows it got it wrong, tries again. T catastrophe, gets it right. Catastrophe. And then he has some swear words, again, automatic, that I've edited for you. Ka, kata, swear word, swear word again, and he says, I don't know. Okay, so he can produce it some of the time, but not other times. And that's the hallmark of apraxia of speech. It, they're, uh, they're inconsistent errors that are made. It's different from a dysarthria, which is also a motor speech disorder. A patient with a, let's say, Flaxid uh, catastrophe, I mean, um, dysarthria would say catastrophe, catastrophe, catastrophe. It's always the same. The errors are always the same. Okay? Here the errors are very different and they're really at the phonemic level. David? Are they the, error, the error is the function of the phonotactic probability? Are low probability long items harder than because the patient says, I don't know what it's called and so on? which is an automatic phrase, by the way, and he says it all the time. This is a man with Broca's aphasia. Can you use that to probe? Well, we've... Physical frequency effects for production or something? Yes, so we've actually probed for length, um, number of consonant clusters, amount of travel that you have to do with, with the articulators, if they're velar and uh, up to bilabial, um, so how much, how much and how rapidly you have to move the articulators. And it really has, it really comes down to the amount of travel that you have to do rapidly. So in a consonant, cl consonant cluster, like, um, um, like a testrophe, so the stro is very difficult for patients with a proxy of speech because they don't have the vowel in between to kind of give them a moment to get the rest of the articulators moving. So we can go into it in more detail a little later. I'm just looking at the time. So they don't, appendic they don't speak Japanese, so they don't appendicize vowels like that. Katasrifrobi is like a vowel appendicis, right? Well, again, I don't know about Japanese, but you, 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 my Italian neurology colleagues say, what is that apraxia of speech? You know, what does it really sound like? What would it sound like in Italian? Well, you don't really hear it as much in, in Italian. Now, where you really hear it, 
um, and additionally is, for instance, in Chinese, where tone is involved, the coordination of the larynx is also an issue, and patients will make errors in tone as well. So it's coordinating all of the articulators really, really fast in order to make the sound come out the way you want. And what we did basically was we overlapped all the lesions of the patients who had problems there, and they fell within this small area of the insula. I'm going to zip through here. The insula is a little region of the brain. It's cortex underneath the, the frontal and temporal lobes. Um, and basically what we find, I'm going to show you this side by side, is that if we take the patients who have a diagnosis of apraxia of speech, now remember, this is only a motor speech problem. It's not a language problem. These patients can have perfectly good language skills, maybe a little bit of word finding problems, and all they have is a pure apraxia of speech. Now, so what we find is that all the patients with apraxia of speech had this lesion. Here, 100% means yellow. This is an old system that we used. All the patients with apraxia of speech all have lesions in this small little area. These are patients who met the same diagnostic criteria, sorry, met the same selection criteria, but none of them had apraxia of speech, okay? Their lesions are all over the left hemisphere, just like here, but now their lesions spare this SPGI, the superior tip of the precentral gyres of the insula. We can go into details later, but we've got so many other interesting things to talk about too. Now, why is this important? Because that lesion overlay that we did actually encompassed the, encompasses the insula. And there were neurologists like uh, um, um, Pierre-Marie and uh, François Moutier who said, you know, it's not about Broca's area at all. It's about the quadrilateral space. It's about this area underneath, but nobody believed them. Well, why is it important here? It's important because the hallmark of Broca's aphasia, a feature of Broca's aphasia, one of the symptoms that occurs in every patient I've ever seen is apraxia of speech. So all those patients are going to have lesions here. So that overlay that we saw that involved a large part of the insula is, a, is probably a reflection of the apraxia of speech. Now, that means that in other disorders, in other syndromes, you should see it too if they have an accompanying apraxia of speech. Here are patients with a sort of non-fluent anomic aphasia. Their main problem is they can't find the names of things, all right? But they have an apraxia of speech. You overlap the lesions, you get this, you get that area again because of the apraxia of speech. So the point is here that lesion analysis can reveal some pretty specific brain behavior relationships, but you really have to narrow the behavior down. We're talking about the coordination of complex articulatory movements. If you say pa 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 pa, you don't need your insula for that. If you say parika 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 parika, you could try it. It's harder. You need your insula for that. That is not your entire insula, only this small tiny region of the precentral gyrus of the insula. Okay. So here we're, I'm trying to convey that. Aphasia syndromes don't localize because there's too much going on. There are too many problems. And those lesions that cause those aphasias tend to be pretty big. But there are still things, there are still features of those syndromes that do localize. And apraxia of speech happens to be one of them. Okay? Let's look at another one. I want you to keep in mind, though, that, of course, these are discrete regions that belong to a very broad network of areas that support language. So if a patient has a pure apraxia of speech, they have that lesion and maybe a little bit of an area around it, all right? But if they have a Broca's aphasia and other speech production problems, that lesion's going to be bigger. They're going to have apraxia of speech, but they're also going to have a lot of other problems because of other barriers that have been involved, okay? Stay tuned. All right, I want to talk about our first patient. Why is it that he says tono, tono, tono all the time? Remember, he's a severe case. He still qualifies as a Broca's aphasic, but he's got those recurring utterances all the time. We have patients, many patients like this, and the variety of recurring utterances is really amazing. Sometimes you get jargon like tono, tono, or dubdua, dubdua. Sometimes there are individual words like yes, yes, like the man who had to get his keys out of the car and got the security guard to do it for him. Phrases like no money, no money, or my favorite, sweet, sweetie, I miss sweet, sweetie. Now, why would anybody have that particular phrase locked in as their automatic phrase? And the answer is we don't know. 
There's a lot of really interesting psychiatric theories about why this could be, um, but we won't go there for tonight. All right, what happens in these patients? Where do we see the common area of infarction? Well, I'm gonna remind you about the arcuate fasciculus, but I'm also gonna remind you that the arcuate fasciculus joins up with the superior longitudinal fasciculus. So if this is your temporal lobe, your frontal lobe, your parietal lobe, then the arcuate fasciculus comes out of the temporal lobe, arcs up, and goes into the frontal lobe. It goes through all the temporal lobe, by the way, and all of the frontal lobe, not just Broca's and Wernicke's areas. We'll talk about that in a minute. The superior longitudinal fasciculus is more of a parietal frontal, frontal parietal tract. But when they start passing together through here, you can't distinguish between them. All right? Very, on blunt dissection, you can't tell which fiber tract it is, if it's coming from the parietal lobe or the temporal lobe. And so sometimes people refer to it as the uh, AF-SLF complex, like we have here. This is a normal uh, brain with an outline of a lot of the white matter that passes through there. Now there's more than just the arcuate and the SLF passing through there. There's also the internal capsule, right, that controls motor functions going down from the motor strip down into the uh, spinal cord. We're also talking about corpus callosal fibers that cross through there. Well, when we look at that, we can't tell which fiber tract we're looking at. It's just a bunch of white areas on a standard MRI. But we can see here that these patients have lesions in this general area. So here and here. These patients both, and consistently other ones as well, um, have these recurring utterances. Now, most of the patients have very, very large middle cerebral artery infarctions. They're big strokes. And they happen to encompass that area as well. But occasionally we get cases like this that are isolated, and they show us the same symptoms even a year later. And they tell us that something's going on in the white matter there that's really important. Let me give you an example of how we can visualize that. Peter talked this morning about the diffusion tensor imaging. I'm going to show you a little bit more in a moment. But with diffusion tensor imaging data, we're looking at traces or ghosts of white matter pathways within the brain. And we can visualize those, and we can even do what's called tractography to be able to kind of rebuild what that fiber pathway might look, at, look like, okay, where it passes. So here's a patient who had um, a severe aphasia after his stroke that continued for several years. Here's his right hemisphere, so his healthy right hemisphere, no stroke, no damage there, and uh, no direct damage there. And here's what his arcuate fasciculus bundle looks like. Okay, so a nice bunch of uh, fibers ending in the temporal lobe and in the frontal lobe. Here's his superior longitudinal fasciculus also looks, uh, looks healthy, looks like a normal tract. Left hemisphere, lesion. Now look, look, make a comparison here. You can see how the tract has been affected, okay? We can visualize that now. Broca and Wernicke didn't have that luxury, but we do. We can collect that data now with standard protocols. We use different protocols, but you can see um, the damage on these tracts on, on color or DTI maps, um, not necessarily tractography uh, reconstructions like this, but where it can give you a lot of really good information, not only about the cortical areas that are involved, but the fiber tracts that are also involved. So here's the arcuate fasciculus. The lesion is here. Here's the frontal lobe. So those frontal fibers are okay. Now, the fibers that are passing through this region, not so much. If we look at the superior longitudinal fasciculus, look at the difference here. Complete interruption of that tract. So all of these fibers that we should see over here, like we see uh, over here, are gone. Okay? So we don't just see problems in the cortex, we see problems in the white matter producing really profound problems. Our first patient, his problems with his speech being so severe that all he could produce was the recurring utterances is related to this uh, this fiber tract problem. How do we know that? For instance, why didn't Paul Broca's patients have lesions in the insula or in the arcuate fasciculus or AF-SLF complex? Well, one I got really, really lucky. And I asked somebody, a French anatomist friend of mine, um, uh, Odile Plaisant, wouldn't it be interesting if we could scan that brain? I mean, after all, it's in the museum in Paris, so 
you know, let's take a look. All these people doing fMRI and looking at lesion localization and talking about Broca's area, but everybody seems to kind of disagree about where Broca's area is. Let's go and take a, let's go to the museum and take a look at that brain. Well, don't ask me how, but she managed to get permission. And we were actually able to look at the brain of LeBorn. So this is a photograph uh, that uh, Bruno, uh, Bruno de Lomain took and um, of the uh, brain of LeBorn removed from the jar. Um, I, words cannot describe this moment. Okay, I don't look here, look here, all right? This is the brain of LeBorn, and I got to hold it in my hands. I mean, we're talking about the brain that really started our field. In fact, it really launched the field of localization of function in, in all of neuropsychology as well, not just for language. And I got to hold it in my hands. I was flying high for about a month afterward. Anyway, really, really exciting. Sorry? Oh, well, that's another story. Ask me over a glass of wine. <laughs> and no, I didn't drop it. But I had a lot of worries about dropping it, including driving it in the car on the way to the MRI scanner. Anyway, um, what we were able to do was uh, put it in a little dish here and keep it moist with a wet diaper. And uh, ultimately, we were able to get some extraordinary images of this brain that, remember, has been pickling away in a jar for 140 years. In formalin. Actually, uh, originally, they put them in alcohol. But now museums put them in a special museum form, uh, formula that uh, preserves these specimens for longer. But originally it was an alcohol. So here we see the right hemisphere of Monsieur Le Bourne, and here we see uh, where the um, where Broca's area would actually come out to the cortex, would come out here. You could see where these slices are here. Here's the insula, beautiful. Here is the uh, AF-SLF complex. These are beautiful images. I mean, this is the hippocampus. These are the folia of the cerebellum. These are extraordinary pictures. You don't really get resolution like that normally from a patient because, in this case, the brain had to sit in the scanner for the whole day. Well, he, he didn't mind. <laughs> Um, other patients would mind, and so we would never ask a patient to do that, to get this high resolution. And this was at 1.5 Tesla, so this was already, you know, really pretty, pretty great. Now let's look at his left hemisphere. So remember, we've got this lesion here, we've got some funkiness happening there, but we're not really sure what's going on. And here what we see is, um, again, these are the same slices. Here's where Broca's area should be, and it is gone. Here is where the insula should be, and it is gone. And all of this is the fiber pathways uh, that should be filling this area, and they are all gone. So even in Broca's original case, all of these regions were also affected in that case, probably causing different deficits, but the conjunction of all of them together cause this type of aphasia that we now refer to as Broca's aphasia. Here I want to show you the difference between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. So look at this point from here to here. You could see the sheer amount of volume there, right? Look from here to here, much less. Why is that? Why do you think that is? Why is this left hemisphere so much smaller than the right? Remember, yeah. Because of the holes and the alcohol and the formalin you've got into it, um, you're close, okay? It, it didn't actually affect the tissue itself. The stroke, well, his various strokes and various pathologies produced this problem. Remember that this brain was in a jar, so it was not in the head, in which case the fluid would have kept that space open. So because it was removed from the head, now the the brain doesn't have the cerebral spinal fluid to hold it open, and so the brain is basically collapsed on itself, right? So that tells you how much damage there was in this brain. So all of this region in here, so, you know, largely sort of this whole area was, uh, was affected in the case of LeBorn. Well, why didn't Broca see that? Because Broca chose never to cut the brain of that important patient. He thought it might be important one day. And we're so glad he did. Uh, and now we can look at it uh, with the MRI scanner and not have to cut it and not have to change uh, the integrity of that brain. Same was true for the brain of Lelon. So this was the, the um, second patient of Broca's. We saw the lesion was here. And 
In this case, uh, we only had the left hemisphere. For some reason, Broca didn't keep the right hemisphere, and nobody knows why. Um, and we couldn't get it out of the jar. <laughs> we really, really tried hard, but we couldn't get the, uh, the we couldn't break the seal. Decided it wasn't wasn't worth pursuing. We were still able to get some sort of altered images. Here's another question for you. We're, we we um, put the jar in a CT scanner, and we could not get an image. Why do you think? This is old glass. Old glass contains what? Contains lead, exactly. So the scanner couldn't uh, penetrate the lead. So we couldn't get it with the CT scanner, but with the MRI scanner, we got this image. So here, and what we were astounded to find were lesions deep inside in the AF SLF complex in patient number two of Paul Broca. Broca could never have known that because you would have to actually have cut through the brain in order to see that. I want to point out something else, though. Look at this here. This is not healthy tissue. In fact, the description implies that this patient had Alzheimer's disease. So again, not our best localization of function kind of patient, but important nevertheless. And it's also why we see a lot of atrophy in that brain. Now, here's an important point. The lesions in Broca's original patients actually did not encompass the area we now call Broca's area. When we talk about Broca's area now, most people talk about Brobman's area 44 and 45. In the case of um, uh, Le Bourne, the lesion was actually slightly more anterior. So it was 45 and um, areas farther, and of course, much deeper. In the case of Le, of Le Long, we saw that the lesion was actually, sorry, only the posterior part of the inferior frontal gyrus, actually only area 44. So we have to be careful again, when we're talking about Broca's area, what are we talking about exactly? If you're talking about your functional imaging results or your EEG results or MEG or lesion analysis findings, specify please what you mean by Broca's area. Specify the specific anatomy of what you're, what area you're talking about. Otherwise, we don't know. Right? You could be ascribing a function to Broca's area that isn't about Broca's area at all. It might be about area 46 or 47. Right? So it's, it's important. Anatomy is important. And if Carl Zillas were here, that's what he would say. <laughs> okay. Um, important to keep in mind, there's your take-home message number three. And um, I'm going to just pause for a moment and ask if there's any uh, questions. We kind of switched our interaction part around where we had that more in the beginning, but any questions at this point before we go on to talk about Wernicke's aphasia? You notice I'm speaking a little bit faster and inviting less interaction, but I hope you're staying with me. All right, let's look at a video of a patient with a Wernicke's uh, aphasia. Are you a man? Girl, girl feet. My girl, I like this girl here. Yeah, you can like that. Are you a man? Mm -hmm. Yes, with him. It's a simple yes and no all question. Other two, all he has to do is nod his head or point to yes too. or point to mm -hmm. no. Thing we be with. Mm -hmm. Are you a doctor? Not with Not for him. No. No. Not okay. That. Good. No, thank you. Am I a woman? Yeah, uh, I'm like him. Mm -hmm. Good people, yeah, so small people. Are the lights on in this room? Uh, I, yeah, I can hear that too, inside of okay. small things like that. He doesn't even look at the lights. Is the door closed? Smell, uh, smell the door smell is right. Just smell to his right. Things? Okay, what's the problem? Budding of physiologists. What's obvious here? He's asked simple yes, no questions. Is he understanding them? No. This is a really severe case of Wernicke's aphasia, but this is what we're talking about when we talk about long-term persisting Wernicke's aphasia. They'll often look like that acutely, that severe, but most of the time those patients will evolve into milder forms of, uh, Wernicke, of, milder forms of aphasia. So what else did you notice? Any of these features? What about his speech? Very fluent. I mean, he's not having the articulatory problems that our Broca's aphasics were having, right? Are the words coming out intelligibly or 
do they really make up a full sentence? No. But he's not having trouble articulating them. That's what we mean when we talk about fluency differences. It's a lousy distinction, and yet it sticks. Right? What about his comprehension? Duh, pretty severe. He doesn't even understand his own name. He doesn't understand really very simple yes-no questions, even when the items are in front of him. His repetition is going to be the same. He's going to reflect his uh, comprehension and production problem in his repetition as well. What do I mean by a production problem? I thought, you know, we were talking about Broca's aphasics, right? You all thought Broca's aphasics had the production problems, and the Wernicke's had the comprehension problems, right? What do you think? Is this production perfectly fine? Is he always making sense? Is he putting together good sentences? No. So the whole notion of production versus comprehension when we're talking about clinical features or linguistic features doesn't really work as well because all types of aphasics have all kinds of problems, both production and comprehension. They have syntactic problems. It's going to be in their production and in their comprehension. Okay? Reading and writing, of course, also impaired. And again, they all have uh, naming problems. We're talking here about a really severe disruption of language without the encumbrance of the motor speech deficits. Right? These, are, this, these types of patients have a core language problem. To me, they're even the most interesting. Why? Because their speech comes out fluently. And whatever you're hearing them say is what they think they're producing. And so you really have a good idea of what's going on in the brain because they don't have any trouble articulating it, right? The motor speech problem is not there. They're making errors like crazy. They're having production problems in the terms of being able to put sentences together, but no articulatory problems that impair our ability to be able to, to figure out what they're saying. Now, luckily, this kind of severe aphasia doesn't happen that often, all right? So out of our I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of cases. We probably have 12, 14 cases that are this severe years later, right? So again, you may see this acutely. Fortunately, many of them evolve into milder forms of aphasia like conduction aphasia or anomic aphasia. <coughs> Where do you think the lesion's gonna be? Eh, I told you already. Same as with Broca's aphasia. Any guesses? Pick a lobe. Frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, occipital lobe. Cerebellum, let's throw that in. Not strictly a lobe. Any ideas? Posterior superior temporal lobe. It's supposed to be the posterior temporal, temporal gyrus, exactly. Right, so in the temporal lobe, at the top, in the back, right? All right, what do we see when we overlap the lesions of these patients? All right, the lesion here is actually not in the superior temporal gyrus up here. It's actually really more here in the middle temporal gyrus, and we see this consistently. Every single patient who has a problem as profound as this patient in terms of lexical semantics, in terms of word finding problems, in terms of core language problems, has a lesion that involves the middle temporal gyrus, but the story doesn't stop there. The MTG is incredibly important. That whole region is incredibly important. But is it because of the cortex? the temporal lobe that's affected in those cases, or is it because of, what do you guess I'm, I'm going to say next? Connections. The connections, exactly. It's all about connectivity. All right, let's take a look. I'm going to skip all this for the moment. Apologies. All right. Peter talked this morning about visualizing the fiber pathways. And of course, if we were able to have access all the time to an electron microscope, we would see that bundles of fibers look like this. They're individual axons that group together so that when they come from their parts of various parts of the cortex, they will group together and then pass forward in the brain, right? Now what we can do, what we see, is just like our little garden hose that's uh, watering our lawn or our plants, water is going to flow in only one direction in that water hose, right? And also, not only the hose itself, but the spaces in between are constraining the flow of water. 
So here's what we see in dissection, all right? If we say, I want to look at what the arcuate fasciculus looks like, I'd have to get a brain, I'd have to cut it open, I'd have to peel away all of these different regions that I didn't want, I'd have to really carefully do a dissection, and this is what I would see. I'd see not individual axons, you can only do that under the microscope, but I would see clusters of fibers that are bundling together like this. And some of them make a long journey from a temporal lobe to the frontal lobe, for example. Some of them make short journeys just from one gyrus to another gyrus. Now, with diffusion imaging, basically what we get to do is um, look at the pathway, the traces of those fiber pathways. So if we go back, here's our arcuate, and we do diffusion imaging, you could see the arcuate here. All right. Remember, we're not looking at the arcuate itself. We're looking at ghosts of where the arcuate uh, passes. You can see U fibers here, really nice visualization by Betty Lee, who I don't know personally, but I liked her image off of the internet, so I borrowed it. Diffusion tensor imaging, as Peter pointed out, captures the flow of water in, um, in uh, isolated directions, and with MRI we can measure that and color code them. These are maps we can actually get right off of the scanner. We can see fiber pathways. The color coding indicates the direction of the fiber pathway. Okay, so this one here in red is measuring fibers that go left to right. So what structure is that? What anatomical structure is that? Corpus callosum, exactly. Okay, hear about these blue fibers? They're running up, down, down, up. What fiber tracks are we looking at there? Let's take ones that are going from the motor cortex down into the spinal cord. Cortical spinal tract, bingo. How about these green ones? They're flowing in this direction. What fiber pathway can we pick up that way? The SLF, excellent. And also, the part of the SLF that travels horizontally, but not that vertical part. We have to look at blue fibers for that. So you get the idea? Color coding gives us an idea of where these tracks are. Do you have to learn your anatomy? Yeah, you do. Otherwise, you're not going to know where they are. Here's that example again. Here's all this white matter. We don't know which track that is. We don't know if that's a, an axon coming from the corpus callosum or uh, through the arcuate fasciculus or uh, through this uh, cortical spinal tract. But if we um, uh, superimpose our visualization of the arcuate fasciculus that we have extracted through tractography, you're not going to get it from just those simple color images. You have to do special procedures to get this. Uh, and then you get something that looks like this. Now remember the textbooks were indicating Wernicke's area to point B, Broca's area. Instead, we're looking at a tract that is incredibly dense. This is a major association pathway in the brain. So Wernicke's area would be somewhere here and Broca's area somewhere here, and yet we see extensions into the frontal lobe, into the temporal lobe, and even into the individual gyri as it goes along. This is this is bidirectional track, by the way, okay? Again, our, the, the figures in the books make us think it just goes one way, Wernicke's to Broca's area, but it doesn't. You can have a signal coming from the frontal lobe into the parietal lobe, for example. I'm sorry, into the occipital lobe or temporal lobe in this case. So we're really looking at a very, very extensive tract, and we've learned that more as we, I mean, it wasn't that we didn't know this before, it's that we kind of forgot along the way. Because if you do the dissections, you see how far these tracts actually go. But with diffusion imaging, we can see how extensive these connections are. This is a particular technique we use called constrained spherical deconvolution. And it has a really nice resolution. This is actually an image that's not even that well cleaned up. Why do we care about those fiber pathways? How can we use diffusion tensor imaging? We could do it in a way like this. Let's look at the fiber pathways that pass underneath the middle temporal gyrus, for example, okay? So we've got our cortical region that seems to be important, but underneath we've got white matter. What's going through there? Maybe it's just one tract. No, it's an incredible configuration of fiber pathways that connect temporal and frontal lobes, parietal lobes, occipital lobes. This is a really amazing amount of traffic going through this one small little white matter area. Here we have uh, um, pulled those different fiber tracks apart. There's actually five major fiber pathways passing underneath here. We could see the arcuate fasciculus, the, the long branch, the indirect branch, 
the inferior occipital frontal fasciculus here is in purple. We can see the, uh, the middle uh, longitudinal fasciculus. We can go through details of each of these fiber tracts if you like. We don't, unfortunately don't have the time at the moment. But. So white matter injuries are important too because when you see a patient whose lesion actually goes so deep as to capture all of those white matter tracts, it's no wonder that an injury to that area causes such extensive permanent deficits. So in this case, your take home message is gonna be white matter matters, all right? It's not just about the gray matter anymore, it's also about those white matter pathways and those connections. These brain areas do not work in isolation. The fibers that connect them help these regions to interact with each other, all right? Now, um, we have a little bit of time, yeah? Not much, because I know we want to get to dinner. I do want to um, play a couple examples for you and, and have you think about the deficits that you're seeing, all right? This is a patient with a type of aphasia that you can see I'm not going to tell you about. He's trying to describe this picture, which is again the sort of standard picture that we use in the Western aphasia battery. So listen first to his spontaneous speech. Tell, tell me what you see and try and talk in complete sentences. You see a guy reading a book, see a woman pouring pour, pour, drink or something, and they're sitting under a tree. Um, and his a, dentures are missing, so that's one problem. Car, car behind, behind that, and there's a house behind the car. And then the other side, side the guy's flying the flight. 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 To think about that right there. See a, a dog, dog there, there guy, guy down, down on a bank. All right, what do you hear so here. far? Fluent or not fluent? Flag. Blowing the wind. Sorry? Put your heat, Very good. Uh, it's actually not. But this type of aphasia is often confused with the, the kinds of deficits you see in apraxia of speech. So hold that thought, okay? So you hear, why did you say that? Why did you think so? Yes, so he's, he's making speech errors and he's substituting some phonemes. To me, to my ear, it's a different quality, but it, you know, it, he's definitely having some speech output problems in that regard. How about his sentences? Is he putting sentences together? Not bad, not great, but he is putting some, some full sentences together. So what kind of aphasia are we thinking about so far? First of all, fluent or non-fluent? No real articulatory problem except for these paraphasias that you noted. How many say non-fluent? How many say fluent? The fluents have it. And it is, in fact, what we would call a fluent aphasia. Now, what kinds of aphasia do we know are of the fluent variety? We saw one before, Wernicke's, yeah. And if, I don't know that you remember the original chart, but what's another feature, what's another key type of aphasia that we often hear about that's also a fluent aphasia? Yes, conduction aphasia. But do we know this patient has conduction aphasia? How would we find out? What would we do to test this? Yes, very good, you guys, the repetition, All right? Okay. All right? Let's have a listen. Say the word bed. Bed. Oh. Nose. Nose. Pipe. Pipe. Window. Window. Banana. Banana. Snowball. Snowball. 45. Six, 45. Sorry, she has to sneeze. To sneeze. Go ahead. <laughs> Get out of here. Felt it coming up. Okay. okay. Ninety-five percent. Ninety-nine per, per nine. Ninety-nine per nine. Okay. Sixty-two and a half. Sixty-six and a half. The telephone is ringing. The phone is ringing. He says the phone is ringing. He is not coming back. He's not coming back. He's not coming back. The pastry cook was elated. 
that year was, what was that last word? I'll repeat it. The pastry cook was elated. The bakery was asking. Okay. Okay, I'm going to stop it there. The pastry cook was elated. He can't get it. But if you say to him, okay, but what was it about? He says, oh, it was something about a happy baker. Okay, what does that tell you? The damsel reclined on the divan, and he says, the, the, I don't know, something about a lady on a couch. What is that telling you? What do you think? Does he understand what he's supposed to repeat? Yeah, he's telling you. He's just telling you in a different way, right? Is he hearing the echo of what I just said or what she just said? He can hear it because he's understood it, but he's lost that echoic trace. This is a classic auditory short-term verbal memory problem, all right, in the sense that they'll tell you, I heard you say it, and then poof, it, it just disappeared, all right? If I ask you to say, pack my box with five dozen jugs of liquid veneer, okay, go ahead, try it. Okay, you don't really have to do it, but what did you do right there? If I tell you, I want you to re remember this phrase and repeat it back to me, pack my box with five dozen jugs of liquid veneer, most people report that they practiced it first. They said it to themselves first. These patients can't do that. It's gone. They just lost it. But they, the meaning got in, and they're able to tell you what the meaning is. So we think of this as a fluent aphasia. They're making paraphasic errors. There's a mild comprehension problem. It's really the repetition that's the key feature there. And in these cases, where we see the lesion is actually typically sort of posterior superior temporal gyrus, which is supposed to be sort of Wernicke's area, and part of the inferior parietal lobule as well. So here we're looking at yellow. Um, and it doesn't matter what the etiology is. There are patients with primary progressive aphasia of the logopenic type, in case you're into this, that um, actually have atrophy in the same area. So if we look at the difference between those high frequency phrases like the telephone is ringing or he is not coming back, you know, it's pretty easy to get the meaning, but you might change it from the telephone is ringing to the phone's ringing, like this gentleman did. Okay. What you see is the distinction between those high frequency sentences and the low frequency sentences where they can't rely on the meaning to give back exactly what they heard. Again, posterior superior temporal and some inf uh, uh, inferior parietal. Okay, these are our three main aphasia types that you'll hear the most about because those features of fluency and comprehension and repetition are the ones that help us to distinguish these. This is how aphasiologists basically do it. Neurolinguists will look more at the linguistic features. Is this person having a problem with lexical semantics or with logical grammatical constructions or, or what have you and can look at the whole process in a very different way. Right? We're not going to have a chance to talk about global aphasia. Essentially, take Broca's aphasia, Wernicke's aphasia, and conduction aphasia, and put them together, and you have a global aphasia. These are really severely impaired patients, huge left middle cerebral artery infarctions. Enomic aphasia, again, these are just patients who have mainly just a word finding problem. Right? They may have other uh, subtle deficits, but uh, it's finding the words that they have trouble with. And we're going to skip the transcorticals for a moment. I'm going to end with this one. What's this that this person is? Again, yeah, he's looking at the Western here. aphasia battery picture. Young men with the uh, tree. No, yeah, tree of the yellow that they use the um, marrows of the light, the light of the wood. Okay, diagnosis? You know, really normally we would not just hear a little clip and make a diagnosis, but you know, what are you hearing? How's his production? Fluent, non-fluent, what his, what's his sentence construction like? What are his, what kinds of sentences is he producing? Are they simple, are they complex? Is he using prepositions? Is he, you know, really, does he have the full grasp of his language system? 
Do you really understand everything he's trying to say? Would you be able to point to the things he's talking about on the picture? He's a pretty severe Wernicke's aphasic. His comprehension is really severely impaired, repetition similarly affected, okay? Now, here's a little, no, no, I'm gonna skip that. Um, in fact, what I'm gonna do is skip, 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 really fast. Uh, we didn't get to talk about how we use resting state connectivity in aphasia, but in looking at uh, the resting state kinds of networks that Peter talked about this morning, we're actually able to look at which networks are disrupted in those patients by looking at changes in blood flow. So just like our normal controls that lie in the scanner and just fixate on a cross on or a red button on the wall, our patients can do that too. They don't mind it. They don't have to talk. They don't have to do anything. They just lie there in the scanner. And we can look to see which of these different networks that are now being identified using resting state functional MRI are affected in individual cases and how those relate, again, to the behavioral deficits that we see in patients. So not only do we have our structural MRI, we have diffusion imaging fMRI, uh, MRI, pardon me. We have a resting state functional MRI, which is easy to do in aphasic patients. You could do task-related fMRI, but you know typically that involves some kind of language processing in the scanner, which is difficult for patients to do and we can capture a lot of that with our other methods. So I hope what I've shown you with some of the different techniques we've looked at is that the areas of the brain that support language are far more extensive than previously thought, and we only touched on a couple of them. There are numerous other regions, many more than what we're seeing here, that have been identified through lesion analysis with brain-injured patients, in addition to those that we have also seen identified in functional imaging tasks, in MEG tasks, EEG, and so on. Many of the techniques Peter talked about in um, normal, neurologically normal individuals as well. So I want you to keep in mind that a complex system like language requires a very extensive and interaction ne uh, interactive network of brain regions and their connecting fibers. So we're not just talking about little Broca's area and little Wernicke's area. We're talking about areas like that in the cortex, all right? Probably 75% or, or more of the left hemisphere of the cortex and the underlying white matter that can be affected and might result in some kind of speech or language problem. Maybe it's a mild problem, or maybe it's a more severe problem, depending, depending on which of those tracks, which of those cortical areas is affected. And so they do different things. Some of them do different things, if you can, local, if you can narrow them down enough, but they all play a role in a big picture of interactive areas. Are there some things that don't localize? I've never found a grammar box in the brain. I've looked but I've never found one. I've never found an area that really contains the entire lexical somatic network. We know that it's affected in temporal lobe lesions, right? But we don't find patients who don't remember that this has a name. We just don't see that, okay? So these are things that we wanna keep in mind. Um, more extensive areas than we previously thought, and fiber, fiber, fiber pathways playing a role. And when we understand this network, it gives us more of the tools for understanding how language is processed in the normal brain, so we can learn about different regions that seem to be supported by these areas. And of course, for those of us who are clinically uh, interested in as well, in our patients to assist them in their recovery from their brain injury. So I'm gonna stop there. I Stop, definitely stopping time, and I will thank you very much. If you want to have more interaction, let's do it over dinner, over posters, over lunch, over breaks, whatever. Um, I've got plenty more to show you as well, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm here all week, as the comedians say. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.